As an introduction, we like to acknowledge that our mission at Vos Library is to advance learning, inspire curiosity, enrich lives, and promote community. With that in mind, let me introduce our guest. Don Reamer is a lifelong birder and photographer residing in Warren, Maine. A board member of the Midcoast Audubon Society, he has led field excursions for local environmental organizations and the American Birding Association National Convention. He is a board member of the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge in Rockland, Maine. Don has participated in multiple citizen science projects, including Project Feeder Watch, the Atlas of Breeding Birds in Maine, the Maine Owl Survey, and the International Shorebird Survey. He has served as compiler for the Thompson, Rockland, and Pimaquid Dermascotta Christmas Bird Counts. Currently, he serves as a regional coordinator for the 2018 to 2022 Maine Bird Atlas Project. His bi-monthly column, Birding with Don Reamer, has appeared in the Rockland Free Press since 2007. His new book on birds, Seen Anything Good, was published in September 2020. Without further ado, please help me welcome Don Reamer. Hello, Don. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, this is exciting. Uh, you know, I'm doing these virtual book talks. It's so different from being with a live audience. Uh, it's different, but it's also nice be because I think a lot of times um, we might get more viewers or more people to hear the message who would want to come out and drive to Camden or Union uh, on a, a dark night. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a blessing in disguise, I think. So uh, yeah, I've written this book, it's called Seen Anything Good, and you're looking at uh, the cover photo. Seasons of Birds in Midcoast, Maine, and of course that's an osprey. He's carrying a, a, an alewife that he had just caught. And uh, this, this uh, photo, I took it down in, uh, here in Warren where there's lots of uh, ospreys in the spring. And uh, one morning I was standing on the bridge over at uh, uh, Payson Park and this, this uh, Osprey flew right at me. And since he and the fish were both paying full attention, I took their picture. And I, at the time, I never figured on writing a book, uh, but I thought, well, geez, someday that might, that's a nice photo. That might make a good a book cover if I ever do write a book. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I finally, I finally did. Uh, and the title, Seen Anything Good? Well, that's an expression that birders use a lot uh, on, when they meet other folks on the trail. It's a common expression. I've heard it a million times. I've probably said it a million times. Uh, hey, you seen anything good? Well, then the question is, what is good, right? It's a relative term. And uh, what, what, what I might consider a good bird, uh, someone else might say, oh, I've seen a million of those. Gee, that's nothing. Uh, but if you think about it, uh, it really has a lot to do with uh, what your expectations are for the day. Uh, if you're a novice birder or an expert birder or whatever, you, you're going to have different uh, expectations. And as one example, you know, we have, we all know what blue jays look like here in Maine, lots of blue jays. But if you were in California, that would be a hotline bird. They'd go, wow, people would travel from all over the place in coastal California just to see a blue jay. So, um, I think that, you know, that has a lot to do with it. So um, I put in a few uh, photos here. So a lot of them are in the book. There are 40 colored photos in the book. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is a group of birders down at Webb Keg Marsh. South Thomason, you, you may know where that is, the Buttermilk Lane down there. It's a famous birding spot. But you know, even with these folks, obviously they, they have a lot of pricey equipment there. They're, you know, their cameras and their scopes, their binoculars. But even with a group like this, uh, so they're, they're seeing different birds out there. And what, what might be really important or significant to, to one person might not be so much with, with the person next to them. 
So in the springtime, we have a lot of photographers and birders who come to Warren. And there's a good reason for that because it's one of the best places around, even I would say across New England, to, to uh, see and photograph ospreys. <clears throat> and what's, what I found interesting in talking with uh, quite a few of these people, they would come, some of them would spend a whole week here. And one fellow told me that, you know, he, because they, they have to have a place to stay, they buy gas, they, they have to eat somewhere. And one fellow told me he thought he'd spent about $1,000 uh, being in Warren for, for the week. So, uh, you know, wildlife and birds especially are a big, quite a big part of our economy here in Maine. Uh, and uh, it's a good thing. And also the, this river, I have a, uh, the George's River, I have an essay in there about the river. And uh, the, the river wasn't always as pure and clean as it is now. Uh, years ago, there was a rope factory there and a lot of uh, stuff going into the water. Not so good for, for birds and for fish. And now uh, the, the river has recovered itself. It's, uh, it's a healthy river. It's full of fish and birds. So that's, that's a great success story. Um, so let's see, speaking of good birds, here's a, this is my grandson when he was 18 months old. And uh, he had taken, a, he, he came, to, came to the house a lot and I, we always had binoculars on the uh, windowsill had, had a big chart with birds on it. And uh, little Adrian, he was out and he was, a, he really had a good bird this day. This was a robin he was looking at. And uh, you know, it could have been the rarest bird in the world, but to him, it was a really, really, really good bird. <laughs> and you can see how focused you might say he is on that bird. He was just locked right on it. So th that, was, that was a lot of fun. I have one in there about grandchildren, about some of the fun things that we've done uh, you know, as a families and stuff. So um, I think a lot of a lot of what we bird people are interested in is just trying to get closer to the birds uh, and just maybe understand them uh, a little better. Uh, th th this was just a random uh, situation here. I was out in a place with some uh, uh, alders and there were chickadees there, and I said. Geez, I have some seeds in the car just for fun. I'm going to see if I can get one of these chickadees to land on my hand. So I went and got a handful of seed and, and I got up next to the bushes. There were three or four chickadees there. And uh, I started making these sounds. That will bring a chickadee right your way if you, if you start doing that. They, they're very curious. And before I knew it, I had this little guy came out and he was brave enough to perch on my finger and take seeds right out of my hand. So that, that was kind of fun. Through the years I've had uh, opportunities to be close to birds, to, to handle them a little bit, uh, mostly in a rescue situation. Uh, this, this was a, a hermit thrush that was, I found one chilly morning, one spring morning. And I think he was just simply cold. He was, he was beside the road. And he was just, uh, just sort of lethargic, just sitting there. And I, I went and captured him, brought him, brought him uh, back home, warmed him up a little bit in a, in a box with a towel. And a few minutes later, off he went. He seemed no worse for wear, just, just took off. But I guess he was cold that morning. Shorebirds, I have quite a bit of uh, information on shorebirds. Uh, one of my, I think one of my favorite groups of birds, the shorebirds, because of their long distance uh, migration habits. This little guy here is called a semi-palmated sandpiper. And what that means is that between his toes, the webbing in his toes, he has a little bit of palmation, a little bit of web. And that's what it is. It's half web, semi-palmated sandpiper. These little guys come out of, uh, Tundra. These are these are young. These are baby birds. Believe it or not, these these are probably a month and a half old, perhaps two months old. And all these all these sandpipers came in one shot. They came out of the tundra. They landed in this is West Keg Marsh. They stay there for about two weeks and fatten up. They feed day and night with the tides. And at the end of the two weeks, they've doubled their weight and off they go. 
And these little guys go all the way to South America. Many of these birds will just fly over the ocean for about over two and a half days. And the next land that they touch is Northern South America. So this is a little bird that weighs about as much as an envelope. You know, they're just so tiny, but just so amazing that they can do that. And then of course there are larger shorebirds. This is a Hudsonian godwit. This, this is like a crow sized uh, shorebird, one of the larger shorebirds. And they're also spectacular migrants. These guys, most of them uh, actually uh, fly nonstop from the Arctic breeding grounds entirely over North America and down into South America, about 4,000 miles, one jump. They're just big, powerful birds. So oh, the book has, uh, the way it's set up, it's not a field guide in any sense. It's a, it's a series of short essays uh, about different topics, uh, common birds, uh, more unusual rare birds, uh, and just their, their migration habits, lots of things about them, some conservation issues in there, a few conservation issues. So, uh, and I suppose that people over Union Way uh, I, I go over there some and I, I see bluebirds uh, in quite a few places up around Clary Hill and, and uh, over towards Coggins Hill, those places. Uh, it's good country up there, open country for, for bluebirds. <coughs> Excuse me. And sometimes you might see a flock of 20 or more. They're, they hang around uh, some in the winter and especially if they have something to eat, if they have some berries or whatever, uh, they're good to go. And they're just so beautiful to see. A big comeback story for them with the bluebird boxes that folks have put out. I have a story about bluebirds in there. And then I mentioned maybe some rare birds. This, this is a super, super rare bird here. This was the great Blackhawk that came and, and spent uh, a couple months in Portland, Maine. It, it had net one, they had never been seen above the uh, Texas border, never been seen in North America until one appeared in Texas. And guess where it came next? It ended up in Maine. They know it's the exact same birds, be, bird because they uh, took photos of the underwings and compared them in feather for feather. This was definitely the same bird. Unfortunately, the, these guys are a desert bird. They eat snakes and lizards and so forth. And uh, although it was catching uh, lots of rodents, squirrels and rats around uh, the, the park down there, uh, it finally succumbed to frostbite and then they had to euthanize. It was a sad, sad situation, but it just shows you how a, a bird like this could travel three to 4,000 miles and guess what, end up in Portland, Maine. So that's, that's sort of the mystery and the fun of, of birds. Pelicans. We don't see too many pelicans in Maine, but I saw this one. It was down around Tennis Harbor a few years ago. And sometimes storms will bring birds north. Uh, that's often a big thing, especially with uh, seabirds. Anything around the ocean just gets blown uh, northward uh, if there's a, one of those big old uh, storms that comes up the coast. So uh, yeah, I've got a story about this guy. I call him Big Bird and he certainly was big. Very big. And here's a bird that, uh, a species that's extremely rare. This is called a bronzed cowbird. Well, in Maine, we have uh, brown-headed cowbirds, which are, uh, they're a nest parasite. There's lots of them around in the summer. This guy here, this was, this is a bird that you would see in Mexico. And it ended up in Rockland, Maine in 2010. And a fellow who knew, happened to know birds pretty well, looked out his uh, window and saw a flock of blackbirds and he noticed that one of them had red eyes. And he said, whoop, well, this is the broadest cowbird and it was the, the first and only record that I know of for, for all of New England that they'd ever even been seen around here. And what was, what was comical is that uh, this was a, a hotline bird and when the news got out, uh, we knew that a lot of people would come and try to see it. So they warned the neighbors down there that a bunch of nutty people might actually be coming to their neighborhood, but they were totally harmless. Don't worry about them. <laughs> so uh, 
you know, that's that's the way it goes. I, in fact, that reminds me, I, I have a little, I, let me read you a paragraph out of my book about <clears throat> my own situation and how I got interested in birds as a kid. Um, as a oh, seven, six, seven year old, my mother was very much into birds. So she got me going on it. And I'll just read you a, it's just a short paragraph. The number of birders or bird watchers as they were termed in those same decades was limited along the coast. A recollection of seeing two birders probing through roadside shrubbery at Pemquid Point comes to mind. I was intrigued by the binoculars around their necks and the purposeful manner of their quest. The pair stood riveted on some obscured bird, seemingly oblivious to the cars slowly driving past them a few feet away. With great envy, I pondered what they might be seeing. I'd already come to understand that bird watchers were an eccentric bunch and perhaps even a bit ditzy. But whether bird watching implied eccentricity or ditziness, it didn't matter to me. I was eager to sign on. So that's how I sort of got going and the rest is history. I've always been, I've remained interested in birds uh, through the years, studied them a lot. And, and done a lot of citizen science things, which helps you to learn even more. Okay, here's a, I don't wanna to focus too much on rare birds, but this is an extremely rare gull. Most people, you know, you see a gull, you say, yeah, he's gonna steal my sandwich or something at the beach. Well, this guy, this is a mew gull and they're a Eurasian gull, has no business being uh, around here but this bird was actually out behind the Thompson grocery one morning with some ring bill girls. And I'd been looking for years to, to find one. And sure enough, I drove in, there was, there was the bird and I photographed it. People came from all over the place to see this guy. Okay, then owls, we can't leave out owls, you know. Uh, here's one with the moon behind him. And I did owl studies for uh, over a decade uh, up in the Palermo area, there was a, a circuit of woods up there that I used to go. It was an 11 mile a ter a road that I would stop and, and listen for owls. So uh, lots about owls. Here's the barred owl, the most common of our owls, most numerous of our owls around in these parts. And uh, just as a quick tip, if you see a, an owl that has brown eyes, it will be a barred owl. They're the only owl around these parts that has brownish eyes. Even at a distance, uh, you can notice that the eyes are dark. So it's a dark eyed owl, sort of gray looking. It's a barred owl. Who cooks for you? <laughs> okay, you might hear some of those outside your window because believe it or not, owls, especially uh, great horned owls are starting to nest now already. They start in January early nesters. And we're seeing some snow owls this winter. There were at least a couple down at the Portland Jet Port. Um, there's been a couple over towards Clary Hill up in that area. Uh, they come down in the winter time when, when uh, lemmings and food up there uh, gets short, they'll come down here and, and looking for food. Uh, beautiful owl, a, a powerful owl. Uh, they actually up in the, uh, uh, Arctic regions, they'll go out on the sea ice and hunt uh, seabirds. That's how rugged they are. They're just a powerful owl and fairly heavy too. Aha, uh -huh. and sometimes bad things happen to good owls. Here is a, here's a great horned owl uh, who had captured a crow. He has this crow in his talons. This is a story in the book. Uh, one morning on Route 17, I was driving along and saw this thing in the road and I didn't know what it was so I went back and here was this great horned owl. He and the crow had simultaneously hit a, hit a car when he was crossing the highway with it and uh, they both got wiped out but the the owl still had a clutch on the, on the crow. His, his talons were right around the crow's body still hanging on to him. Red-tailed hawks, you have a bunch of those over Union Way You'll see them a lot. Uh, I think this photo might have been taken actually up in Union. Uh, they'll often sit on power poles, power lines, uh, looking for mice. They, they eat a lot of rodents. And uh, that red tail there, it takes them two years to get to acquire that. 
the first year is sort of a browny uh, striped tail, but they get that rufous red tail at age two or so. Peregrine falcons, we have those now. They actually nest uh, in two places that I know of locally. One would be over in the Camden Hills State Park. The other one is uh, on the roofs of the Dragon Cement Plant. They, they like high places and they're remote places. And they've been very successful nesting right on the roof of the cement plant for the past few years. And this guy has a, he has a pigeon. He has one of Rockland's finest pigeons uh, in his clutches. And he's going off to have breakfast. This was a morning shot some years ago. But you can see what a large and a powerful uh, falcon the, the peregrine is. And here's, here's a, a, another red-tailed hawk not doing so well because uh, uh, four or five years ago, we had a power outage uh, just before Thanksgiving. And my wife and I were out of power for four days, which meant that our freezer, we had a turkey, a frozen turkey in there. And uh, at the end of the four days, my wife pronounced it unfit to eat. She felt it had thawed. I did not. I felt it was still probably a good thing to eat, but I didn't dare to. So I thought, well, I will repurpose this bird. So I went out and staked it out in my backyard to a clothes, clothes pole out there. And my wife said, you'll never, that will never go anywhere. You'll never see anything. One day she's doing dishes. She said, oh my God, there was a, there was a great big uh, full adult eagle standing on top of the turkey eating it. But after that, this raven, this big male raven, giant bird, he showed up and he took over the whole territory. He occupied a tree out back and anybody that came and tried to get near the turkey, he would come and attack them. Well, this poor red-tailed hawk showed up thinking that he was going to get some of it. And you can see what happened. The raven just put his wings out, made himself look as large as he could and just stomped right out towards him. And the, and the red tails, his tail is actually in the snow. He's back on his haunches. He went really So that was a good, that's a good, that's in the book. That's a good story. Goes on for a while. Some of the silly things that I did. A friend of mine thought it was such fun that he went on a smaller scale and bought a Cornish game hen. Well, you know how big those are, right? He put it out in his in his backyard, hoping that a, a raptor would come and take it. And within 10 minutes, a fox ran off with it. And I said, you have to stake them down. You can't just put it out there in the backyard. So, and then I, I, uh, I studied or I watched uh, turkey vultures for two years, two seasons, as part of the main birding, uh, bird atlas project. And uh, a lady over uh, over Warren Way, West Warren, told me, called me and said that she actually had uh, a nest of vultures that had been there for a number of years, every year. So I went over and I set up and I I, uh, I photographed them as they grew. And this, uh, you can see that uh, <laughs> they're quite a mess until they get fully uh, feathered. Uh, and you wouldn't think a bird that was all dark, almost black looking would be white, would have, uh, would have white downy feathers, but that's how they look uh, when, they're, uh, when they're young. And I have some birds in there that um, people you probably don't see a lot. Some people may not even know about uh, some of these birds. This is a, a blue gray gnat catcher. It's a little tiny bird, smaller than a chickadee. And they, they actually, there's a, they make it into Southern Maine as breeding birds and probably mid coast now. I think we're finding a few pairs that are nesting, but a, a little, an unusual little bird, uh, real spirited, and they they often have the tail up in the air, this just jaunty looking uh, posture. So that's blue gray gnat catcher, and here's a bird. This is called a chestnut sided warbler, one of the most beautiful warblers that we have. And the reason I put one reason I put this bird in the book is because uh, how how uh, populations change over time. When John James Audubon came through Maine in the early 1800s on his way to Labrador, in his whole lifetime, he saw two of these birds. And here's someone like Audubon who was out in nature just about every day of his adult life. He saw only two of these birds 
in his in whole life because at that time uh, we had a mature uh, spruce forest covering the, the area and chestnut sided warblers need uh, short secondary growth. So there wasn't any habitat here for these to even be around here. And in the, in the spring, summer, we could take a ride with, put the windows down in my car and we could probably hear 20 or 30 of those singing on territory in a half hour ride. That's how plentiful they are now. That's how things can change uh, in nature. And then we have sparrows, lots of sparrows down at West Keg Marsh. And they, these are marine sparrows. These are guys that nest uh, between the tidal tide cycles. They, they build a nest between each month we have these big flood tides. And what these little birds do is to build a nest in between those two intervals. They, they lay the eggs, they hatch the eggs and, and the, the chicks uh, are able to climb up on the grasses when the high tides come again. Most of the time that works out. But these little guys are marine sparrows. I actually saw an adult sparrow, adult sharp tail, and notice the, the tail feathers look like little pointy arrows. <clears throat> I once know, uh, saw a, an adult sharp tail sparrow actually feeding a tiny fish to its baby. It just crammed this fat little fish right down his gullet. So who knew, who knew that sparrows would eat fish, right? Lots of things in nature to, to know about, to learn about. And here's, here's Mr. Woodcock, American Woodcock. Great bird, they come here in the early spring, even when there's snow on the ground. This was like three inches of snow and this, this fellow had shown up and uh, they have that long bill. They will find, even in the spring, uh, the snow cover, they will find muddy places where there are earthworms and things, things down in the mud They'll stick that bill down and it actually opens up. It's like a prehensile thing. It's like fingers that can grab, grab the worm under underground. And uh, quite a quite a uh, tricky little bird called timber doodles. Uh, they, they do uh, these uh, elaborate uh, aerial displays during courtship, uh, a wonderful little bird to see. And actually the way that their brain is configured, it's put in there upside down so that they can while their bill is under the ground looking for worms, their eyes can see 360 degrees around them to make sure that predators can't get them. So uh, all these things are just amazing in their own way. And they're all in my book. Uh, the book is, is selling pretty well. I'm re really happy with the way it's selling. And here's some places that uh, you can get it. Uh, Owl and Turtle, Sherman's Bookstores has five of those in Maine. They sold a lot of these books for me. Archipelago in, in uh, Rockland, but I noticed that Archipelago has closed for the month of January. So, but, uh, and also you can go on uh, Amazon and buy it. But what I tell people, if you, if you are interested in buying the book, please buy it at a local bookstore because we really need to help these guys out. Uh, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to lose our bookstores for that's for darn sure. And they're, they're a real asset. I, I love going in a bookstore and just being in there and browsing around. So, uh, well, I think that's, that's all the slides I have. If people uh, want to have some questions or whatever, uh, I'll do my best to answer those. Thank you so much, Don. We'll just see if there's anybody that wants to post anything in the chat and sure. Please, please, please just unmute and ask away. So I can stop the share now, is that correct? Yeah, let's do that. But let's do that and then. Great. There we are. I'm gonna ask the first question then. Sure. So my husband and I are pretty sure that we've got a barred owl that likes to um, kind of spy on us when we do our morning walks. And um, I'm curious about their territory. Like how far would a barred owl claim its space? Mm -hmm. Well, the, I think their hunting territories are, you know, are fairly, fairly large, but the, the area around the nest, they would, they would, that would be smaller, quite smaller. Um, they don't, owls don't build a nest typically. They'll, 
they might uh, take up an old crow's nest that isn't being used. Some owls will nest in a, you know, in a cavity and hole in the tree. Um, there's a variety of settings. Sometimes I've seen um, great horned owls uh, settle into osprey nests, big old stick nests. And there's a battle there when the ospreys come back and here are these, <laughs> yeah, these sizable owls in your, in your room, yeah. so to speak. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, I think hunting territory wise, they might probably be within a, oh, let's say a mile, maybe, maybe less. All right. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. So Elizabeth is asking you any information on the thick build mirror. She's questioning the spelling this week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I photographed one this morning right down at uh, down at the gig store down uh, uh, when you go down past West Keg Marsh and continue on where the river empties out. Um, and uh, because yesterday they, there was one over at the Rockland Breakwater that was attacked by a loon. They had quite a battle, I guess. Uh, the loon kept beating up on it and trying to drive it away from his fishing territory. And at one point, the uh, the mirror was up right up against the breakwater wall, trying to get away from the uh, from the loon. And some friends of mine took some spectacular pictures of the of the mirror very close to them. But this morning, anyway, before work, I just was out for a little ride, and I pulled around the corner there by the gig store, and here's a mirror, a thick build mirror, right there by the bridge, right just sitting in the water. So. Uh, you know, birds can show up anywhere. They do have wings, as my friend used to say, you know. So, but uh, th this is the time of year. They're, they're sort of an Arctic type nester way up. And they, uh, they, come, they come down this way in the winter time. Uh, razor bills, uh, a lot of those types uh, of birds, little ox, they're ox. They're in the penguin family, but black and white basically. So, yeah. Thanks, Don. Um, Marion is sharing. I don't think there's a question, but sharing that they, she and her husband had a close encounter, a great close encounter with a barred owl on top of Mount Batty yesterday. That's fantastic. Ah. I would Ooh. love to hear more about that. Maybe you could unmute yeah. and share. That's um, neat. Joel is asking any tips for finding sawit owls and why do they have that name? Yeah, well, the, I'll do the easy part first. Why they have the name? <laughs> because uh, it's it's little, <laughs> and what supposedly that sounds like back in the days when they used to sharpen hand saws, and they they would call it wetting the saw, like you know a whetstone. Well, that's how the sawed owl got its name. It really sounds these days. It sounds more like the uh, the backup beeper on heavy equipments like this doot 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 it's it's rhythmic like that and uh, if you're you almost have to be out there early and late because they are they're quite vocal they they sing a lot uh, saw wet do so uh, I guess that's my best advice the other thing is if you happen to be an early riser and you want to drive around mornings just as it's getting light and at that point you can see the outlines of trees you know, sort of like a painting with the, the skeletons of the trees. And often you'll see, well, sometimes you'll see a bump or a lump in the tree, or you might see something looks like a cat sitting there, which would be a great horned owl with his ears sticking up. But uh, dawn and dusk are good times if you just, if you happen to be out anyway, and uh, to drive, just drive around and, and uh, you never know, you might, you might find one that way. But saw wets are, I think the voice is probably the best way if you happen to hear one. Great. And Elizabeth is asking, why do barred owls fly into cars so much? I think it's just because they're so, they, they happen to feed along roadways a lot because you have grassy margins, you know, and um, a few winters ago, we had a, just an explosion of saw wet owls. And I know Avian Haven was overrun with all these owls that have been struck by cars. And again, you'll, you'll see them, uh, often see them at ro along roadsides because I think that's, that's an area where, you know, they might have a better chance of seeing a mouse running around, a little running out. Uh, it's unfortunate, yeah. 
Do we have other John? questions? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, go right yes. ahead. Hi, John, this is Steve Mansfield over on the middle road, Warren. Oh, hi. Right on the union line. My yep. wife and I were walking the other day and there's a, an old dead pine tree, old uh -huh. gnarly pine tree sitting there. And I noticed all of a sudden these two giant holes in the pine tree, probably about six feet off the ground, wood chips all over the place mm -hmm. and had drilled in and got to the point where there was a hollow, I think it reached the hollow in the tree because it's just an opening. So there's this big hole ending in a little opening. And I couldn't yes. see what that was. They're looking for bugs. It certainly seemed to be a strange place for a, a pileated or somebody like that to be building a nest. Any idea yeah. what's going on? Well, it sounds like pileated to me. They, the, the type of ants that they like are often in the center of the tree, I'm told. Yeah. So they, that's, I think, one of the reasons why they drill in so deep. Uh, you know, looking for those special uh, things inside, way inside the tree, mm -hmm. and supposedly they can they can actually hear. They their hearing is tuned so that they can hear insects crawling around inside of a tree. Wow. So it isn't they don't just go in vain hunting, pecking every tree, but they they have a good idea before they start if they'll find uh, uh, you know ants or whatever they are. I think it might be like carpenter ant type. Uh, critters that they like to, to feed on. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple of pileated woodpeckers in the neighborhood. And we always know where they are. They make quite a. Oh yeah, they're very vocal. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Black-billed cuckoos on Clark Island became aggressive when we mimicked their call. Had to move yeah. away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I can believe that. Yeah, yeah. If 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 that's during their nesting season, they're probably thinking, you know, who's this competing cuckoo out here? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Let's see. Uh, I'm just waiting to see if anybody else puts anything in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I know you had the cover of your book. Don, do you have it right there just to hold up? Because I just want to make sure people know we have this at Vos Library too. Sure. Let's see. There it is. I have to back off a little bit so it'll fit in there. Yeah, there, yeah, there it is. There's, a, there's, that, there's that Osprey and the Hellwife co starring on the cover. <laughs> it's a great cover. And I, yeah, and I will say too that. The, the from feedback that I've gotten about the book so far, a lot of people have told me that they like the fact that it's um, short essay form because they can spend five or 10 minutes and get a whole story. And then, you know, they, you, they don't have to commit to a 45 minutes of reading. And several people have said that they have my book on their nightstand. And one guy said, you're the last words I read at night, every night. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I think that's a good thing. It is. Very good yeah. thing. Elizabeth yeah. is giving you a shout out in the chat, Don. She said, love your columns in the free press. Read it every single Thank week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Don, what size lens did you use to get that Osprey picture? Yeah, I, I have a, it's a 400 millimeter. It's a fixed lens, mm -hmm. a 400 millimeter. So uh, yeah, it, it's, it reaches out there pretty well. Did you have that on a on a tripod? No, it was just no because the bird was flying right at me, so yeah, I had to be just you know do it by hand. Most of your flight shots, you have to do you know you get them by hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't see any more questions. Don Joel is thanking you for the talk. He said, "Great as always." Well, thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. I. It's a great audience there. I'll just wait a moment just to see if anybody else had anything to, um, to ask. And then I'll do a little wrap up for us. Hi, Deborah. Right. Oh, hi, Lori. Hi, I, I actually sent you a few questions, but they must not have gotten through. So no. Lori, I'm gonna have to talk in person. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. 
my I had two questions. One was, um, what's a good time of day to have for a snowy owl sighting on Clary Hill? Well, uh, yeah, snowy owls, uh, they're used to hunting. They're, they're a day hunter because okay. up in the Arctic, you know, you, you sometimes have 24 hours of daylight. You have no choice. <laughs> so yeah, they, they'll hunt during the day. They spend an awful lot of time just sitting like a lump. They, they'll sit on a stone wall or in a field someplace. They like open areas. I've seen them down at uh, Owl's Head Airport before. Mm -hmm. Any place that, uh, in some of the beaches, uh, Popham Beach and Reed State Park, those places where there are dunes, they like places like that too. But it, it's mostly, you know, barrens. They like that. It's reminiscent of where they, they live, just mm. barren areas. Okay, th thank you very much. Sure. Um, also, a neighbor of ours is interested in putting up an osprey nest. Um, any idea on how tall the pole should be? How tall? Yeah, like what the specifications would be. Yeah, yeah. I, offhand, I don't know, but I would think uh, you would you wouldn't want it too low because then they might you know they might be discouraged to use it. But I think most of these most of these uh, nests seem to be fairly high in the air. Yeah, the ones that I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Should should it be should it be uh, should 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 the platform he puts up be uh, uh, started with some some uh, wire or something that they can weave their their sticks in. Yeah, yeah, you'd yeah, it would help to have something, some kind of a platform structure that would, uh, you know, hold the sticks. Because if they drop them, they won't go pick them up. They'll just get more sticks. I don't know if you've ever <laughs> seen that, but sometimes there'll be piles of sticks underneath <laughs> the nest that just didn't work out. It may be. You know, like young birds that aren't real experienced at, at building a nest, and yeah. they just go and goop the yeah. whole thing up. Uh, <laughs> they keep bringing more sticks. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. 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 Enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? These are great questions. And Don, it's just um, really been a lot of fun to listen to you talk about your book and actually, you know, your your hobby and your your profession and all mm -hmm. of it wrapped up in one. And yeah. um, just really, it's just really fun to listen to somebody that knows so much about a topic such as what we just listened to. So well, thank, thank you, you thank much. you, thank you. And I appreciate you reaching out and I'm so happy that we have your book in our library. So great. Thank you very much. Indeed. So I'm just going to um, conclude. This concludes our presentation for this evening. All of us at Vos Library, thank you for attending our Zoom with Vos Wednesday series. And we hope that you'll spread the word and also join us on Wednesday, January 20th at 6 p.m. where Bill Stinson, owner of the Poor Farm, We'll be talking about his brewing adventures. So, all right, everybody, good night, be well, and stay healthy. Okay, thanks, everyone.